all the brachot, all the learning, all the inspiration should be liluy nishma, lezecher nishmas, in loving memory of Luba, of, of Luba, Luba bat mazal, neshama shav naliyah, amen. And with this being presented by the Chazak organization, of course, we want to thank Beth Gavriel for opening, for opening their doors for, for this event and for so many years, such a place of Torah and, and tefillah. It's tremendous. And um, for, so as an introduction to Rabbi Meirov, as we know, the Chazak organization puts on organizes events like tonight, inspires hundreds of people every, throughout the week, thousands of people throughout the year. But what might not be as, known, as well known is that uh, Chazak's main focus is to inspire the tens of thousands of, of public school students literally down, down the block from here and, and throughout Queens and, and well and beyond through after school programs and Sunday school programs in 15 different locations. And, with, uh, and um, uh, since 2017, over 1,200, 1,300 children transferred from public school to yeshiva. So everyone who's, um, who's here, everyone knows someone who has children in public school, they should reach out to Chazak, help them give them a Jewish education through the after school Sunday school programs. And, um, and without introduction, one of the co-founders and directors of Chazak, Rabbi Ilam Irov, is, is a great honor to, for the rabbi came here to inspire us. Bachavot, everyone, please, please rise, Rabbi, rabbi Ilam Irov. Good evening, Moray Rabutai. Bershuda Rabbanim. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here tonight to speak. Yerilun a very special woman. A woman that has many great descendants in this world. I apologize in advance. I can only speak for a few minutes. I have another shiur upstairs soon. But uh, you're going to have great speakers after me to hopefully inspire everyone. The topic tonight is don't count the days, make the days count. Everyone's counting the Omer, one, two, three, four, five. But how do we make these days really make an impact on our lives? I want to ask you a simple question. Someone from the men's section, can I have a volunteer over here? How old are you, Tadek? Eight. Eight. You know, the truth is, this question might be a little too tough for an eight-year-old. Should I ask you or no? Okay. Imagine, imagine, chas it should never happen. It should never happen. But someone comes with a gun to another Jew. And he says to him, I have a gun over here and I have a cheeseburger over here. Eat the cheeseburger or else I kill you. Do you know what's the halakha? What should a person do? What do you say? Don't do anything. But he's giving you, he's saying do A or B. You have to choose something. What do you say? Run away. Run away. Oh, he's a smart kid. <laughs> Don't eat it. Your brother helped you out, huh? Don't. So according to Halakha, what is it? You eat, you eat the cheeseburger. You save your life. What if he comes to you? Not with a cheeseburger, with a piece of pig, chazil. He says, you eat the pig or I kill you. Run away, very good. <laughs> According to Allah, what do you do? You eat it. What if he comes to you with pig and Yom Kippur? He tells you, eat it or I kill you. What do you do then? You run away, I understand. But besides that answer. <laughs> According to Allah, also eat it. Save your life. The only time he tells you to give up your life is time of Shemad or three cardinal sins. What are the three cardinal sins? If they tell you, kill someone or else I kill you, then you say, you know what? I'm not killing him. Kill me. Commit adultery or else I kill you. Kill me. Commit idolatry or else I kill you. Kill me. Those three sins are so bad, we tell you better off, give up your life, then do it. But the other Averot, you violate to keep your life going. This is the Halakha. With this being said, I want to ask you a simple question. A very simple question. There's a Gemara that tells us, 
גדול תלמוד תורה יותר מהצלת נפשות. You know what that means? Learning Torah is greater than saving a person's life. Learning Torah is greater than saving a life. Now what does that mean? It always bothered me. As a teenager, I learned this Gemara in Yeshiva. What do you mean learning Torah is more important than saving a life? So if we hear someone screaming outside, help, help, help. We should just stay here and not move. Hey, we're learning Torah. Find out who's sick. We'll say it while they're dying outside. What does it mean learning Torah is more important than saving a life? This is a whole shiul to discuss, but I just want to spend a couple of minutes because I'm very short on time. You know, we have the world is Baruch Hashem, round. We have different time zones. Here in New York, what time is it now? It's about 8.30 p.m. If you want to call someone in Israel, you have to sit there and start doing some math to figure out what time it's in Israel. Should I call him? Should I not? Different time zones. When we go to sleep over here, they're starting to wake up over there. Why did Hashem create different time zones? There's a famous story with the Gaon with Vilna. The Vilna Gaon was once giving a shiul to a bunch of guys. And during the shiul, a 12-year-old boy walks in. And the Vilna Gaon, who's the greatest rabbi in the past who knows how many hundred years, he stands up for this little boy. He stands up for this boy. And the students are shocked. Rabbi, why would you stand up for this kid? They asked him, Kodara, like, who is this young man? Why did you stand up for him? And the rabbi said, bring this boy over here. He calls the boy over and he says, listen. What did you do last night at 2 a.m.? The boy said, Kodara, Rabbi, you know, I was twisting and turning. I couldn't fall asleep. So I got up and I started learning for a few minutes till I fell asleep again. The rabbi said, Chazak Baruch. He tells the boy, the boy to walk away. And then he tells his students, I want you to know, this boy last night, when he woke up to learn, there was an instant, there was a second where no one else in the world was learning Torah besides him. It's because of him the world kept going. Hashem created different time zones. In Blo Britiya Manvalaila, Khukocha Man Vahrit Samti. If we don't have Torah at every moment of the day, we wouldn't have a world today. We gotta have Torah every time, Torah any time. Otherwise there is no world. That's why the rabbi stood up for this, stood up for this kid. So the Torah is a big, it's the oxygen of this world. But still, what does it mean learning to us more than saving a life? How can it be more important than saving a life? So I want you to hear what I'm telling you, men and women. I remember this for the rest of your lives. Here's an example. Imagine you have two individuals. You have Ruven and Shimon. Ruven lives on 100th Street. Shimon lives on 110th Street. They're living 10 streets away from each other. At 9 p.m., both of them are sitting and learning Torah. They're learning 9.30. 10 p.m., they're still learning. 10.30, they're still learning. 11 p.m., they're still learning Torah. Now, 11.05 p.m., Reuven hears someone screaming in the streets, Help! 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 Should Reuven go outside, yes or no? Should he close the book, yes or no? Obviously, yes. And Reuven goes outside. He performs CPR, mouth to mouth. He does tchiat amitim. He brings this person back to life. Baruch Hashem. In the meantime, his friend Shimon had no idea. He was still learning in his house. The next day, they both come to shul. Who's going to be the hero in shul? Reuven walks in. Everyone's like, oh, Reuven. You're my master hero. They give him a hug. They take a picture with him. Everyone's talking about the newspapers. How Reuven did CPI to save a person's life. And he deserves the credit. He did it. And everywhere Reuven did it go for the next few weeks, everyone will talk about it. Wow, how did you do it? You were there at the right moment, at the right time. 
In the meantime, Shimon, who was learning at that time, no one knows, no one cares. But guess what? Listen very carefully. After 120 years, Reuven and Shimon go up to Shemaim. Now they're being judged about their whole life. When they reach that moment of 11.05 p.m., of that same night, Reuven had to stop learning to go save a life, which was a mitzvah. But Shimon was in a different area, and he what? He kept learning Torah. In the heavenly courts, who gets more reward for that moment? Shimon, the one learning Torah. Learning Torah is a greater reward than doing anything else in this world. Yes, I'm obligated to go save the life, 100%. But for you to understand what your Torah is doing, what your Tehillim is doing, it's a different league. It's a different level. We're standing right now in the days leading up to Shavuot, the holiday of Shavuot. That's when we got the Torah. How do we make these days count? I'll share with you a very simple idea which all of you heard once before. I want to imprint this in your neshamot, in your hearts. Imagine I tell you I'm going to give you a million dollars in 30 days. How are you going to count those 30 days? You're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. You're going to go 30, 29, 28, 27. You're going to count down. That's the normal way of the world. So the famous question is, why Sfirat Ta'omer? What do we do? We count up. 1, 2, 3, till we reach 49. So we all know the answer. If I say I'll give you a million dollars in 30 days, you're going to count down 30, 29, 28, right? Why? Because it's 30 days separating you between today and the million dollars. But what if I tell you I'll give you $33,000 every day for 30 days? Which means by day number 30, you'll have a million dollars. You'll be counting up. Oh, I got my first day of 33,000, second day of 33, third day of 33. Because you don't have 30 days separating you from the great day. Every day is a build up to the great day. We're counting up to the Omer, you know why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have to build ourselves up to Shavuot. You got to make sure now, this time of, of the Omer, ladies and men, you work on yourselves to increase your Torah, increase your Tehillim, increase your character improvement. Control your anger, control your patience, stop being jealous. Give more tzedakah, do more chesed. This way you're going to reach Shavuot full of mitzvot, full of spiritual energy. And you can tell the difference of who worked his way up to Shavuot, who didn't. Because we look at the holidays, some guys come to shul. They're standing outside drinking their coffee, smoking the cigarettes. They learn a few minutes and they go back outside. Then you have other guys that are sitting the whole night reading and learning and analyzing. So we still have the opportunity. Baruch Hashem in this shul every single day. The shiurim. Rav Tomer is here in the back. He'll be speaking soon. Every single morning in the morning he gives shiurim. We have night call upstairs. Shiurim of different rabbis. There's no reason why people, men should not be here every single day to learn Torah. If you cannot come in, Baruch Hashem, we have a good friend that's already time for men and women to be watching shiurim. And Chazak does shiurim in many different shuls in the neighborhood as well. Baruch Hashem, you have so many great shuls, great organizations, great people. Take advantage, especially now before Shavuot. This way when we reach Shavuot, Rabotai, it's not just going to be another holiday. You'll be living the holiday of Shavuot. You'll be living the Torah because you exercise your muscles. You learned, you worked hard to reach this day of Shavuot. I want to say to the family, although I did not know the Nifteret, I know the family members. Baruch Hashem, all of them, Yirat Shamaim, good people, people that have a good heart. And Blei Nara, you see so many people came out for the Shi'ul in her memory. Bezrat Hashem, she should be a Melitz Yosher to all the family members. Everyone should be healthy, spiritually and physically, Bezrat Hashem. And we should be zocher to have a real Kabbalat Torah and Shavuot. 
and to have the ultimate Geula Bezrat Hashem with the coming Mashiach Tzidkenu to see Tchiat HaMitim Bezrat Hashem B'mera B'yameinu Amen V'Amen Thank you Rabbi Mira for your powerful amazing words we're here um, B'chavod um, Rabbi Shimonov, one of the one of the rabbis in the in Beth Gavriel, the community, one of the leading rabbis in the community. B'chavod, everyone, please rise. Rabbi Shimonov, sleep down. Le'eloi nishmat lubabad mazal kol ha'yosartim b'toch ha'shavuva b'toch ha'chodesh u'b'toch ha'shana. Sivodnya adinatzet mesitzav kagnets nami этой легендарной, умной женщины, которая оставила после себя большой след. Люба Бадмазар, дай Бог здоровья, Яков Календаров, ее муж, они есть одни из тех костяков, которые в свое время мы организовали Бет Гавриэль. Они не только сами пришли в синагогу. Дети, внуки, правнуки с ними ходили. Вот она была такая, Люба Бадмазар. Я помню, мы посмотрим сейчас на ее портрет, она очень красивая женщина. Она не просто была красивой внешней, но внутренней духовно красивая женщина. Я помню, когда она заходила в синагогу к нам, к женщинам, Увидев ее, все женщины поднимали свои стулья. А почему? А потому что она заслуживала этого. Рахматку на Люба Бадмазал. Я помню на уроке Таилим третий этаж. Почти каждую субботу она проходила слушать уроки. Читать Таилим со всеми нашими женщинами Анши Цион. Но у меня сегодня вопрос такой. Написано, бесхуд нашим цатканьот, анахну нигалум мисраим, что основа основ выхода евреев из Египта – это наши женщины. И я вот так посмотрю и скажу сегодня, в субботу мы изучали перки Авод, и начало перки Авод написано такие слова, что ни один человек не может не вздуматься в это. Если человек рождается, а почему он умирает? А если он умирает, зачем ему надо родиться? Все это для чего нужно? Вы посмотрите, ей 83 года. Свою жизнь она сделала все. Дай Бог здоровья дочери Фриды. Вот эти 11 месяцев, она для нее делает то, что нужно делать, еще больше, чем что нужно делать для своей мамы. Вот посмотрите, сегодня шиур, это илюя нишмата, это большое дело сделать шиур. И вопрос такой, а почему она должна покинуть этот мир, когда она построила свою семью, внуки, правнуки, дочь, зять и все остальное? Вот это время, когда она должна быть с ним, вот она должна уйти. В чем вопрос? Когда мы изучали, начали изучать перки Авод, который мы его изучаем 6 недель между Песахом и Шавод, написано, «Кол Исраэль ешла им хелег ло улам амба, ва амех кулам цадыким». И сразу задается вопрос, как можно так сказать, что кол Исраиль ешляем хелег лоламаба, каждый еврей имеет свое участок в грядущем мире. Но второй вопрос, они говорят, что все евреи, они праведники. Я сразу могу задать вопрос, это же неправильно, все не могут быть праведниками. Есть праведники. Есть наполовину там тут, есть и злодеи, решаем. А в чем дело, что говорится здесь в Амехкулам Цадыки? Вопрос, 
прихода души и тела в этот мир очень маленький и понятный. Это есть точка такая, чтобы овладеть грядущий мир. Приход еврея в этот мир, чтобы он завоевал себе грядущий мир. Больше ничего. Все остальное беготня. Задам вопрос. Не дай Бог, не говоря о наших детях и внуков, родился ребенок, прожил несколько часов, ушел. Есть такое? А зачем? Что он сделал? Какой грех у него есть? Зачем он должен прийти был сюда? А зачем должна была мама таскать его 9 месяцев из-за нескольких часов, которые он пробудет в этом мире? Что вопрос? Вопрос в том, что этими часами он сделал то, что не успел сделать в своей жизни, когда прожил этот человек. Мы приходим сюда с миссией, что написано в нашей Торе. Мицвод у Масим Туви. Вы знаете, что если человека спросят и скажут, что для тебя так в этом мире очень дорого? Что дорого? Самое дорогое у человека – это его время. Вот время прошло, не вернешь. Вот шла мы сидим сегодня здесь. Все мы уйдем через несколько часов, этого больше не будет, не вернешь. Вот это драгоценное время. Есть люди, которые тратят это время по пусту. Пустота. А есть ли люди, которые берут это время, используют это время, что им дал Бог это время? Вот это и есть жизнь. Свои 83 года Рахматкуна Люба Бадмазар, она успела сделать очень много. Очень много. И написано так, живи так, что после смерти ты осталась живая. Вот это она. Хотя она покинула этот мир, она считается, что она живая. Она с нами. В каком случае? В том случае, если ее дети, если ее внуки и правнуки по стопам Торы. Она успела поставить свои рельсы, успела сделать все, что так нужно было, идет все за ней. Вот это если Элюй Нишмата. Человек придет в этот мир, человек уйдет с этого мира. Если на минуточку посмотрите, 5783 год. А где наши деды, пра, пра, деды, пра, 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 деды, все там? Мы здесь. Отрезок вот этого 83 года жизни дает нам то, чтобы завивать градущий мир, как мы сказали. Олам Аба. Олам Азе, Олам Шекер. Олам Аба, Олам Аэмейт. Когда человек уже завоевал в тот, тот мир, он может там пойти и наслаждаться теми мицвод, которые при жизни он успел сделать. Остается мне сказать так. Очень трудно. Лояков, календаров, амболистышов. Это очень непросто так потерять свою сопутницу жизни и остаться без ней, которые они вместе жили. 64 года. Но я одно могу сказать. Дай Бог здоровья дочери, дай Бог здоровья внукам. Они заменяют ее, но до конца они все равно не могут заменить. Я прошу Бога, чтобы Бог вам дал много силы. Илоим саломат боше, дзахути торо, йор боше, аврохо бошмо, йор боше, сол бене кикзуре, розой не кик бачоу на веро, а веро бим. Ламетим тихия, улхаим гаула, амен кен и рацион. Oh. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes. Another applause, please, for Rabbi Shimon of Shlita, Azagul Baruch, for the powerful words tonight.
Kiyumi Nishmat, all the Shiurim, all the to all the Torah, all the Learn Tonight, and all the Brachot for our Libri Nishmat, Zecher Nishmat, Luba Bat Mazel. It's a great, great honor. It's a good to call upon you know, the rabbis of the shul, somebody who's inspired so many community members, young and old, everyone in between. Rabbi Tomer Zino, everyone, please rise. Please. Good evening, Shut, Rav. The Divrei Torah Shavili Nishmad Luba Bat Mazal. I want to speak about a different part of the Sviat Omer. A lot of people are now doing all of the minhagim of avelut, of mourning, not shaving. We don't have weddings. We try to avoid making shahayanu. The Gemara Sechid Yevamot, Samech Bet tells us 12,000 pairs of the students of Yikiva passed away in this time. We commemorate their passing by accepting upon ourselves all this azari, all this mourning. The question is why? What does it have to do with us? The Gemara tells us they all died of Azkara. They all died of a slow, choking death, a disease. But where did they get this disease from? It wasn't just a random plague. The Gemara tells us because they did not honor one each other enough. Each one was concerned with their own kavod, their own respect. Everyone was in their own little lives. And they did not see one another, they did not see eye to eye. And the Baruch Hu was judgmental in this time. And he took many of our great, great sages. The Ben Ishai and the Ben Yoyada explains the Gemara doesn't say that there was 24,000 students. It says there was 12,000 pairs. Zugot. Why 12,000 pairs? Just say 24,000 students. Because he knew they needed to work on this. He knew they needed to work to be drug drugam, to be together. But what? So there he made for he made them pairs. You have to learn Havruta. Learn not just yourself, with another person. And with Chudad, they should live. He knew they had this problem. But still, they did not survive. Many times in our lives, it's very hard for us to get along with other people. We judge other people. We don't think other people are for us. There's a famous mashal that the teacher, professor came to his class. He gave all his students a piece of paper. And he says at the test, you have to tell me what you see on the paper. And everybody gave, wrote their one sentence, two sentence answer, and they said, we're done. And he told everybody, he read every single answer, it was all the same. He gave them a piece of paper that had a black dot on it. They all said, we got a piece of paper that says a black dot on it. That's all we see, a black dot. And he told everybody they failed the test. Everybody didn't pass. They said, why? We told you what it says there. He says, no, you told me there's a black dot. You didn't tell me there's a white piece of paper. Then many times we focus on what everybody bad has, what everybody negative did. We don't see that there's a whole picture. We don't see that there's a whole, a lot of good that a lot of people do. There's a famous story of a person who was sitting in the airport waiting for his flight. He brought with himself a bag of cookies. He opened it. He started eating. And someone sat next to him. It was a very busy terminal. And he started also eating cookies. And he said this to himself, what nagle this guy? He sits next to me. He's eating my cookies, Isha. He asked him, excuse me, who are you? Who are you? Who are you eating my cookies? And he says, what do you mean? I'm eating my own cookies. He goes and he opens his, ba opens his bag, he shows him, these are my cookies. He says, what do you mean these are my cookies? The person who accused him, he opened his own bag, he sees that he didn't even open his own cookies, he opened his neighbor's cookies. He opened his friend's cookies. He judged him. He right away saw him for negative. Right away he's, he jumped to conclusions. There was a famous video of Rabbi Wallerstein, Allah and Shalom Rahmat He showed... He went and he said, I went to a bunch of rabbis and I asked the Allah a question. I took a big bottle of water and I asked, what bracha do you make on this? And this rabbi said, Shakol. He asked this person, what bracha do you make on this? He said, Shakol. Every person, a bunch of people asked, what do you, bracha do you make on this? Shakol. He said, all of you made a mistake. They said, what are you talking about? This is water. He says, here, open it. He opened it, he smelled it. They smelled it and they saw it was vinegar. 
And he said, you see, you would have made the wrong bracha. There's no bracha in vinegar. How can you say it's shakol? First smell it, see you really know what it is. Then say what it is. Then say what bracha to make. But what? You just saw the label. Everybody's on the labels. Everybody judges by a book, by its cover. Everybody just says, yeah, it looks like this. It must be like this. Did you speak to the person? Did you ask more about them? Did you get to know the person? Right away, we, we, we judge. We look at the labels. The Midrash in Kohelet says, what exactly did they not give kavod to one another? What did exactly they not do? They did not collaborate. They did not get together with other people. They were busy with their own Torah. They weren't willing to do Torah together as a group. The sages tell us that Torah is acquired by Habura in a group together. Rather, each one was on his own. There's my shul, there's my program, my shiur. How many people come to mind? How many views does my video have? Takiveshi, these kind of things. That a person was busy with my personal growth, my personal gain, my personal honor, and not the other person's. Rather, the sages tell us that no, we have to be together. The only way a person grows is by spreading the Torah. More people should learn. More people, yeah, if it's the, it makes a difference. The Gemara says a story about a great sage. He had a very low voice. He used to have meturgaman. He used to have a, a person who used to have a loud voice. He would go and say whatever the, the words the Torah the rabbi said. He would say it louder so everybody could hear. There was no microphone. One day, they told the rabbi, rabbi, you know, the person who's, who yells what you say, who announces what you say, he doesn't even say the divrei Torah you say. He says it completely something else. And you know what he said? The rabbi said, doesn't make a difference. Is there learning Torah? That's all besed, that's all good. What does it make a difference? What I say, what he says, they're learning, that's all that matters. This is the type of perspective we should have. My shul, your shul, people come to my shul, your shul, it doesn't make a difference. What does it make a difference? As long as they're learning, that's all that matters. People are growing, people are doing mitzvot. Person should not let person, personal gain, personal motives mix into the Torah. This is the avodah we do in the Sefer Omer. We know so many people, Rehozeh Bet Shuvah and Bet Gavriel, Rehozeh Bet Shuvah and many shuls, because of the good group of friends, because of the rabbis who came close to them and made them feel warm and friendly. People wouldn't be Rehozeh Bet Shuvah by themselves, but because they were in a group, because they were in a community, because they were other people, they saw other people do mitzvot, they saw other people go to shiurim, they got inspired. They said, unbelievable, this is exciting, this is something I want to do also. They see, they, they copy. So therefore, we have to learn that they were all by themselves. And this time in Surat Omer, we have to be together. There's a famous story of a Jew who found out he was Jewish. He didn't know he was Jewish for a long time. He found out he was Jewish. He lived in South America. And he wanted to know what it means to be a Jew. And he found out through connections that a place to go learn about his roots. He has to go to a place called Yeshiva. There was no Yeshiva where he lived. He found out there's a big yeshiva, the biggest yeshiva in America that he could fly to in Lakewood. He dropped whatever he had, he bought a ticket, he put all his stuff on the side, and he went to go try to get to this yeshiva. He gets all the way there, he spends money he doesn't have, he lands in Newark, and finally he's about to leave and then customs tells him, there's a problem with your visa, there's a problem with your paperwork, I'm sorry. We have to send you back. And he goes, they're trying to take him from arrivals to departures, and he starts crying. He starts telling him, no, you can't. I left everything. I, I don't have any more money. I can't go back. I, this is my life mission right now. And they had no mercy on him. They sent him. They put him in a car. One of the security guards is going to take them in the car and take them to departures. He's sitting in the back of this car, and he's crying to Hashem. And he's saying, why is this happening to me? And he's sobbing and he's saying, I'm trying, I want to learn, I want to go to yeshiva. And the person driving the car, he can't hear this, this crying, it's killing him. He says, why are you crying? Stop crying, stop sobbing, please. He tells him the whole story. And he heard that he says, what, you want to go to yeshiva, what's that? You're Jewish? He heard that he's Jewish, he turned all around the car, he went back to the arrivals. He says, wait here five minutes, he went inside, he came back, he says, here's all your paperwork, go. Get out of here. And he said, what happened? What did you just do? He said, you should know I'm the head of customs here. I'm the one who's in charge of this whole department. I happen to be, have to be the one with the car, so they called me. But you should know many years ago, I used to work in this airport. I used to work in this place. 
I almost was, I was directing traffic, a car almost hit me, and the Jew with long peyot, he pulled me out of the way and he saved my life. I asked him, how can I reward you? You want money? What should I do for you? He said to me, all you have to do is next time you see somebody Jewish, go save his life. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting years. I didn't see somebody else that needed to be saved who was a Jew. And I was waiting and I'm waiting. You told me you're Jewish. I found my opportunity. Then a person has to realize when the Jewish people are united and the Jewish people are out looking for each other, when the Jewish people care about each other, when the Jewish people say it's not just about me, it's about thinking about somebody else, these kind of great miracles can happen in Am Yisrael. Somebody told me that many, a few years ago, someone was late to a meeting in the city. He had to go to a very important meeting in a lawyer office. He was working for a lawyer. He was looking and looking and looking for parking, couldn't find parking. And he said, you know what, I'm fed up already, I can't, I can't look for parking anymore. Hashem, please. He finally finds a parking spot and then happened to be somebody else also found that parking spot at the same, parking spot at the same time. They both get out of the car and they say, no, no. They're both Jewish people. He says, no, I was here first, no, I was here first. He says, you know what, it's okay, you can have it. I don't want it. And he gave in, he said, Hashem, I gave in for you. I was so fed up, I needed this spot very badly, I'm losing money because of this. But he gave in for Hashem, he says, for another Jew. He drove a few very blocks away, he was very late to the meeting, but then he found out when he came out from the meeting that a crane fell and everybody in the four block radius was not able to get out. Everybody was stuck there for hours, nobody could get out anywhere. But because he, blocked, he parked so far away, he was able to go home. See, this that he gave into the Jew, Hashem gave him back. This is the kind of mentality that we have to have. People say, why should I help this person? What, do, what does it help me? Why do I need to waste my time with them? Like the Baruch Hu says, you take care of my children. You, see, you care about another person. You don't only think about yourself. I also think about you. I also take care of you. If you take care of my children, I take care about you and your children as well. We see that Rabbi Kiva, can you imagine your life work is to make students, Tamidei Chachamim, to have a big yeshiva. Rabbi Akiva definitely accomplished that. He had 24,000 students. That's a big hit. That's unbelievable. And yet, on what? Between Pesach to Shavuot, 34 days, according to Shuchan Aruch, all of them pass away in one month. One month to lose one. One month to lose two. One month to lose two. Five students in one month. A thousand students in one month. 20,000, 24,000 students in one month. Isn't that kill a person? Doesn't that break a person? Doesn't that think my whole life work, look up what an empire of Torah I built, everything to fall in one month? And what does the Bikiva do? Does he go into depression? Does he go and cry? Does he go and say, forget this, I'm not a good rabbi, it's not for me, forget everything I did, it wasn't worth it? Nothing. What does the Bikiva do? Like the Bikiva said in Mara Masech Brachot, how his chicken died, his hamor died, his candle went out, and he said, Everything God did is for good. And here too, he also said everything God did was for good. And what did he do? He got another five students. He started over. And who were these five students? One of them was Rimeir Balanes. One of them was Rabbi Shun Bar Yochai. Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Yose. Greats, giants. And what? If he would have gave up, there would have been such rabbis. If he would have gave up, there would have been no continuation for the Torah. We have to learn from Rabbi Kiva. That we get up no matter what, no matter how bad it was. We get up, we start over, we continue. There's a famous mashal. They say about a person who was a water carrier. He used to bring water from the well. Back in the day, you had to go put two buckets of water, put it on a stick, and carry it on your shoulders all the way to the house. And one day, one of the buckets, they got rusty. They got a hole. And happened to be that the water started dripping out of this bucket. It wasn't able to carry so much water. By the time he would get to the house, half the bucket would be gone. Half the bucket would be empty because of the hole. Obviously, it's a mashal, but the mashal goes that the bucket that was complete said to the bucket that had a hole, you see, I'm better than you. I'm complete. I don't have a hole. I'm perfect. You have a hole. You're not perfect. 
I'm better than you. My, the owner likes me more than you. And then after months of using these two buckets, the owner sat down and said to the bucket that was a, with a hole, he says, you're my favorite, you know why? Because, because you have a hole, by the time I walk home, there's flowers on the path and I water those flowers every day because you have a hole. So therefore, you're my favorite because you have the hole. This is how we have to learn from this mashan that we have to look at each other and yes, some people say, look, you have a hole, you see? I don't have a hole, I'm better than you. But that's not the mentality we're supposed to have. That's not the mentality we're supposed to have, Sifat Omer. 24,000 students of Yekiva passed away like that. We're supposed to have, yes, I have a hole. Hashem gave me this hole. Hashem created me with this hole. And because of this hole, I will feed and I will give water and I will create beautiful things because of this hole. And that's what each person has to remind themselves. That's what each person matters. We cannot have a minyan without 10 people. You could be God of Lador, you cannot pray by yourself. You can ha not have the Jewish people without a community. We do many things for Lilin Nishmat and Niftarim. We do a lot of things for our grandparents, our parents who passed away. We do Yeshua, we spend a lot of money for them. We go out of way to show, give respect. I believe the most respect we could give to our loved ones, the most respect we could do, the most beautiful thing we could do to Nishmat is to have a family that is united. To have people who look past differences that they might have had and they fought between family members and they said, you know what? I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to give her nahat and I'm going to go and make peace with you and we're going to forget about everything in the past. That's going to give real nahat. This is going to be worth them more than everything else that you did for them. All these parties and all these events and all this money that we spent, they'll tell you it's not worth it for me to see my grandkids from Shamayim. I see them all fighting, not together, not united. They can't sit in one Shabbat table. This will be the biggest Lulun Nishma. This will be the biggest Nahad Ruach. This will be the biggest message to take away from Sifat Omer. We see in Eretz Israel how many siblings passed away. How many brothers passed away. Sisters passed away. There's a famous story about how he used to put himself in Galut. He used to kick himself out of his own home. He used to go into these travels to go and do soul searching, to go and work on himself and his midot. There was one time he was away from his house many, many weeks. He finally decided to come back home. He's walking to his house and he hears people running in the street. He hears people saying, Gavriel, Gavriel, poor Gavriel, what's going to be with Gavriel? He got nervous. He says, my son is also Gavriel. Maybe my son is sick. Maybe something happened. I don't know. He goes faster and faster, he comes closer, and he sees more people, he sees a lot of people in his block. And he gets more nervous, more nervous. He finally gets to his house and he sees all the medical staff and everybody running into the neighbor's house. The neighbor's son was also called Gavriel. And he says, oh, wow, thank God it wasn't my son. And right away he realized he made a mistake. Rarely, right away he realized, why, why, why was I okay? Why did I say, thank God? My neighbor is my brother, he's another Jew. He's also, it's also my son. It's also my family. He said, now I'm not gonna go back home. I'm gonna go back to Galut. I'm gonna go back home, I don't deserve to go home. How could it be that I see somebody else suffering, I see another Jew suffering and I don't consider it my own. I don't consider it's part of my family. I don't consider it that all the Jewish people are really one. I will end with this. There's a story about a Jew who used to go to his Rebbe, he was very poor, he used to go to the Rebbe, he used to go learn Torah, pray with him, learn with him, grow with him. Eventually, he stopped coming. All the guys in the group said, where's so-and-so? Where's Shlomo? He doesn't come anymore. What happened? The Rebbe said, don't worry, don't worry, I'll go take care of him, I'll find him. He found out what happened to Shlomo, Shlomo became millionaire. Shlomo became very wealthy. He became busy. He can't come no more to the shiurim. He can't come no more to pray. He can't come no more to be in the group. He knocks on Shlomo's door. He says, oh, Kodarav, what a guest, what an honor to have you. He says, yes, can we sit down? Can we talk? He says, of course, my pleasure. Please come in. He sees he has a beautiful house, beautiful rugs, chandeliers, beautiful decoration in his house. He says, Shlomo, come here. I want to ask you something. He says, look, look in this window, what do you see? 
And he sees the people in the bazaar running around back and forth doing business. He sees a lot of people. He says, turn around. Shlomo, what do you see now? He turned around, he's facing his dining room mirror. He says, what do you see? He says, I see myself. He says, why? <coughs> it's the same thing, they're both made out of glass. Why do there you see outside, you see other people, why this one you see yourself? He says, because you know how they make mirrors. They make mirrors by they put silver lining behind the glass. That's how you make a mirror. In the Hebrew, it's called kesef. Kesef is silver in Hebrew. He says to him, Shlomo, we remember very carefully. When there's kesef, very easy only to see yourself. When there's no kesef, it's see-through. You could see everybody. All of a sudden, everybody else matters. But when there's kesef, it's very easy to only think about yourself. Robotai, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're, we're having in our plate, we cannot let difficulties between family members, we cannot let kesef, money, come between one, between one, of, us, one of us and another family member, one of us and another community member. Find it in your heart. If you want to make Teshuvah Shlema, you want to give Lui Nishmad, your Niftarim, you want to learn the lesson from the students of Rabbi Kiva and Sriyat Omer, find it in your heart to forgive. Find it in your heart to see the good, not only the bad. Find it in your heart to move on, to make peace, to become Shalem, to become Am Yisrael, with the Be'al Goat Tzedek, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen. Round of applause, Rabbi Tomer Zeno, Shlita, tremendous words tonight. I want to remind everyone, um, we're going to have some more food at the end of the event. And all the brachot, and all the learning of t tonight should be Lilui Nishma, Lazekha Nishmas, Luba Bat Mazal. Tonight, the final speaker is world renowned speaker and author of Pesach Kron. Everyone, please rise at a couple for the rabbi. It is a tremendous chus, a great honor to have been invited by Rabbi Abov and Rabbi Meirov and to see all of you right after the Yontif of Pesach willing to come out at night to be inspired. It's a great chus for all of us. It's a chus for Chazak. It's a chus for TorahAnytime.com and hopefully we'll all be able to be inspired together. In 1903, a great rabbi passed away. He was the second Rebbe of Ger. He was called the Sfas Emes. And at his funeral, his son, Rabbi Avram, who was going to be the next Ger Rebbe, he would be called the Imre Emes. He was talking to his brother. And as they were walking to the grave, Rabbi Avram said to his brother, Rabbi Tzalel, at least... Our father had Arichas Yomim. Arichas Yomim means length of days. So Rabbi Tzalel said to his brother, what are you talking about? Our father didn't have length of days. He only lived to be 56 years old. That's not length of days. He was born in 1897 and he died, 1847 and he died in 1903. From 1847 to 1903, it's only 56 years old. That's not Arich HaSyomim. Listen to the genius answer that he gave him. He said, I didn't say that our father had Arich HaSyomim. I said he had Arich HaSyomim. Arich HaSyomim means length of years. No one, no one anywhere can guarantee for themselves length of years. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings. But every single one of us can guarantee in our lives a richas yomim, length of days. That means making every day count. And that's what the Imre Emes was saying about the Sfas Emes. It's true, he didn't live long. He didn't have a richas yomim, but he had a richas yomim. And that's what we are coming to talk about tonight. We have come in the middle of days of counting and it's not only a question of counting the days, but it's important to make every day count, to make every day special. 
And if we can learn how to do that tonight, and we can learn that in our lives, then each and every one of us, no matter how long or how short we live, we will all have a richas yamim. And that's exactly why we count these days. Not only to count them, but to make every day count. Now I want to ask you a question. Let's see if you could come up with an answer. Think about it. You know, every mitzvah that we do once in a while, we say shechayanu. Shechayanu, vikimanu, vigiyanu, lazman azeh. We're so happy to live to this day. When we eat matzah, the first night, we say shechayanu. We bless the Hanukkah candles, we say shechayanu. We sit in the sukkah, we say shechayanu. So why when we count Sefirah, don't we say Shechianu? We don't count Sefirah a whole year. Once a year, after Pesach, until Shavuos, we count Sefirah Ta'omer. So why don't we say Shechianu? So there are two different reasons. One reason, the Ran, who is one of the commentaries on Shas, he says something very, very interesting. And he says like this. He says... The only time that we count and we say Shechianu is only when the mitzvah brings us simcha. For example, we light the Hanukkah candles, everybody is so happy. We eat matzah, everybody is so happy. But when you think about, when you count al mitzvah tzviraz ha'omer, you're thinking, wait a second, what is the Omer? The Omer is a karban that we brought in the Beis HaMikdosh. And we don't have the Beis HaMikdosh. So when you say the word Sefirah to Omer, and you think about what you're saying, it brings some sadness. Because we only could bring the Omer when we had the Beis HaMikdosh. And if that's the case, I'll tell you what I thought. What is the first sentence that you say after you count Sefirat Omer? Harachaman, who lanu et avodat Beit Hamikdash. Hashem, please help us have the work of the Beit Hamikdash come back. Why do we say that? I think we say it because that when you counted and you had a feeling of sadness because you can't bring the Omer because we don't have the Beit Hamikdash, so we say Harachaman, Hashem. The compassionate one who Yahzilano Tavorat Beis Amigdosh bring us back the Beis Amigdosh. But the Bnei Yisoschot says something different. He says, You know why you don't say Shechiano? Because we are counting upward to get to Shavuot. Every day we have to get higher and higher and higher. The main thing is not the days that we're counting, the main thing is to get to the goal of Shavuot. And then we're going to say Shechiano. Ki ein hachuka, he says, the desire is not on the days that we're counting, but on the ultimate day. Because every day we're supposed to get higher and higher and higher. And then when we get to Shavuot and we reach the level that we're supposed to reach, that's when we say Shechiano. As a matter of fact, Rabbeinu Bachaya, one of the Rishonim, says something very interesting about the period that we are in now between Pesach and Shavuos. He says, all these days are like Chol HaMoyed. Chol HaMoyed is the intermediate days between the first day of Yontif and the last day. But he says, no, Pesach is just the beginning. And when we get to Shavuot, it's like a Chol HaMoyed. That's why it's called Atzeret. Why is Shmini Atzeret called Atzeret? Because it's the last day of the eight days of Sukkot. So Shavuos is the last day of Pesach in a sense because we are preparing every day to get higher and higher and higher. And then when we get to Shavuot, oh, that's when we could say Shechiyono. So how do we prepare? How do we prepare for the holy day of Shavuot every day to grow higher and higher? So I want to tell you something. You will never forget this. This is so amazing. The first time that I saw this, I could not believe it. The Bnei Yisachar asks a question. Why is Sefirah 49 days? Why not 39? Why not 59? 69? 20? Where does 49 come in? Why 49 days between Pesach and Shavuos? 
You got to hold on to your seatbelts to listen to what he says. It is so amazing. He says, in Pirkei Avot, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was sitting with his students. And he said to them, tell me, what is the most important midah? What is the most important characteristic that a Jew should have? So one Talmud said, Rebbe, I believe everybody has to have an eye in toif, a good eye. Don't be jealous of somebody else. Somebody has more money, more mazal, more nachas, whatever. Be happy for them. Have an eye in toif, a good eye. Another one said, be a chover tov, be a good friend. We all know so many people, but how many of us have really good friends? Be a good friend, that's what's important. And another one said, be a good neighbor. And then Rabbi Lezer ben Aruch said, Rebbe, you know what I think? He said, I believe everybody should have a lev tov, a good heart. And when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai heard that, he said, you all right, that's what the answer is. Because if you have a good heart, then you're going to have a good eye, you'll be a good friend, and you'll be a good neighbor. Now watch this. I know that many of you know that each letter has a numerical value in the Jewish alphabet. How much does lave equal? Somebody figure it out. 32. That's lave. Tov. How much is tov equal? Tess is nine. Vav is six, and Bez is two. How much is that? 17. How much is 32 and 17? 49. Isn't that amazing? That's the reason, he says, we have 49 days between Pesach and Shavuos. Because that's how the time that we are supposed to develop to have the Lev Tov, to have a good heart. So every day from tonight on, if you still can do it tonight, but certainly by tomorrow, every one of us must do something for another Jew to show that we have a Lev Tov. Now, I'm not talking about a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband. That you got to do if you know what's good for you. <laughs> you know, just because you buy a wife flowers on Friday doesn't make you a big tzaddik. And just because she makes you coffee on a hot you know, on a cold morning, she's not a big tzaddikist, right? That's what marriage is all about, hopefully, right? But Lev Tov, oh, that's what it's all about. That's why it's 49 days. So I want to give you some examples of what does it mean to have a Lev Tov. Basically, what we are going to see from these stories that I'm about to tell you is that these people who did these wonderful things, not one of them was thinking about himself. Or herself. They were thinking about others. That's what a Lev Tov is. Stop thinking about yourself only, but think about others. So listen to this beautiful story that happened in a synagogue in Yerushalayim. It was a Sephardic shul, and the rabbi would come every day early in the morning at 6.30, and he would give a shiur. He would learn with 15 people for three quarters of an hour, till 7.15. And 15 guys came every day at 6.30 and they would learn Torah. The rabbi would teach these guys till 7.15 and that's when the tefillah began. Now there was a 16th person there. But he really didn't understand Torah too well. So he decided, you know what? These guys come to learn. I got to get them coffee. I got to get them tea. And he made a whole list. This guy wanted coffee, decaffeinated coffee. This guy wanted 99 milk, this guy wanted red milk, and then it started with the guys with the tea. Herbal tea, regular tea, decaffeinated tea, tea with milk, tea without milk. He had a whole list for everybody. And every day he would come into the base of Medrash once they started learning, and he would bring the coffee and the tea. But he gave everybody a half a cup. Only a half a cup. Now people said to him, Rabbi, you're doing a nice thing, right? You're giving us coffee and tea. Why don't you give us a full cup? Listen, I'm in the kitchen right there. You need more? Just kill me and I'll, I'll bring it in. But he wouldn't give anybody more than a half a cup. One day, he wasn't feeling well. So he goes to his son's room. The son usually davened in another place. He said, listen, I'm not feeling so well. You know, and these guys, they wait for the coffee and the tea. Here's the list. Do you mind going to this synagogue? And they're wonderful people. They come to learn Torah in the morning. Please. Give them the coffee and tea. He said, Abba, for sure, I'll do it. 
and he goes and he gets the whole list and he comes in with the big tray. He's just about ready to walk into the door and here's his father. He said, Abba, what are you doing here? I thought you don't feel good. He said, I don't, but I forgot to tell you something. He said, what would you forget to tell me? Only a half a cup. He said, what are you joking? You only give a half a cup? Don't they want a full cup? He said, of course they want a full cup, but I only give them a half. He said, Abba, why, if you're giving them already, why don't you give them a full cup? Listen to what he said. He said, you see, in the shiur, there are two old men there, and their hands shake the whole time. And if I would give everybody a full cup, they would take it, it would shake all over the place, it would fall on the gemara, fall on the table, fall on their clothes, it would be so embarrassing. Like this, I give everybody a half a cup, they get shake from today to tomorrow. Nothing's going to spill. <laughs> Imagine that. And he said, and if you give everybody a full cup, except these guys a half a cup, they'll also be embarrassed. So he's thinking about somebody else. He never told anybody, except he told his son. And somehow the son told people, and that's how the story got out. But the idea is, that's what Leif Tov is all about. Now here, listen to this other story of Leif Tov. This is absolutely amazing. Many years ago, there was a wonderful person. He was the head of Agudas Yisrael. He was the executive director or the executive vice president. His name was Rebeli Melech Tress. He happened to be my uncle. My mother and his wife were cousins, so he was like an uncle to me. So one day, his son tells me, three Tress, he was in Miami. His father had passed away a long time already. And he was praying in a shul in Miami. And he had his talus bag. And a satma chaser, a guy with a beard and prayers. And he comes over to him and he sees the talus bag. He says, is your name Tress? He said, yeah. He said, you ever hear of Mike Tress, Elimelech Tress? He said, that was my father. And this satma chaser, he just stands and he starts crying. And my cousin said to me, I, I said to the Satma Chosan, I never saw him before in my life. I said, what are you crying? You knew my father? He said, let me tell you a story. They say, you see, I came to New York after the Second World War. It was in the early 1950s. I had no job. I didn't know where to go for a job. I'm a Satma Chosan. There were not many Satma Chosidim. Today, there are tens of thousands. But in the early 1950s, there weren't many. And I came to Satma, I said, guys, I need a job. And they were also looking for jobs. Nobody had a job to give me. So somebody said, you know what? Why don't you go to Agudat Yisrael? There's a man there, Elimelech Tress. He's a wonderful person. And maybe he could find a job. He said, yeah, but he's not a Hasid. He doesn't have a beard. He's going to help me. I, you know, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. Satma and the Aguda are two different ideals. They said, just go, he's a wonderful person. So I went inside, and your father sees me. He sees I'm a chassid, he comes over to me, he said, good, good morning, how can I help you? He said, I need a job. I don't have food to put on the table, I have a wife and two children. I need a job. He said, what do you do? He said, I'm a glazier. I could put windows in, and I could fix windows, and I do glass. He said, oh. I, there's a glazier just a couple blocks away from here. I know he needs somebody. Here, let me write you a note. Give it to him, and you'll see. He'll take you. I know he needs, a, he needs somebody, a worker, just like you. It's been a Shemayim that you came. Oh, he was so happy. He takes the piece of paper. He goes to the office of that glazier, and he says, here, Mr. Tress gave me this. And the guy looks at it, and he says, oh, you're a glazier. That's very good. I need somebody. You could have a job. And he was working. And that Shabbat, that Friday, he got paid on time. He was able to buy food for his wife and kids. And the second week, he was so happy. He felt like a human being. He had a job. He didn't have to be embarrassed to come home without money. He could have food for his family. Listen to this. After three months, the boss calls him in. He says, I want you to go to Mr. Tress and tell him he doesn't have to give me money anymore for your salary. You're a good worker. I'm going to pay you myself. Imagine that. That's what Mr. Tress did. That's what he wrote on that note. 
He wrote, give this guy a job. He needs a job desperately. I will pay his salary, but don't tell him. Could you imagine? That's a Leif Tov. So Mr. Tress, what he was doing was making sure that guy had Parnassah, B'derech Kovod, in an honest and an honorable way. And he made sure that that guy had a job. And the owner, once he saw that he was a good worker, he said, Mr. Tress doesn't have to pay anymore. That's really what Leif Tov is all about. And I'll tell you one more story about Leif Tov. I saw part of this story happen. You can't believe. You see how great we could all become. We could all be great, every one of us here and every one of us watching, a good Jewish people, but we could be even better. And that's what the days of Sefirah are all about, to have that Leif Tov, to have that 49 levels and go higher every time. Listen to this story. In the five towns, there's a woman, her name is Mrs. Yocheved Muller. And she started a closed gemach. A closed gemach means, gemach means gemilas chesed. And they have women twice a year that come into a big warehouse. I was there. And I saw how the women, they divide clothes that they're going to give to people in Eretz Yisrael. Adults clothes and children's clothes. And when I was there, I saw that the women, they sort out all the clothes. If it's shabby and it's got holes, they don't deliver it. They don't put it in the box. They don't send it to Israel because they don't want the people in Israel to feel insulted that they're getting clothes that's not nice. So only the good clothes, of course it's all used, but if it's in perfect condition and it's nice, they'll put it in a box and they separate it and they bring it to this organization in Eretz Yisrael, which is called Karen Minchas Shlomo. It's named after a person who I knew very well in Denver, Dr. Werner Prenzlau. He was a wonderful doctor at a Mohel. His Hebrew name was Shlomo, so they called it Minchas Shlomo. Now listen to this. Twice a year, they send over a huge container, which means it's almost like a, like a train car, on a boat, and all the people who need clothes for their kids they call Mincha Shlomo in Israel, and twice a year, before Pesach and before Rosh Hashanah, they're able to come. Now, they put out all the boxes on a street and no names are written. When you call or a person calls, they give you a number and you show that you have that number and then you get the box that has your number on it. But there's no name, so anybody who's walking in the street don't, won't see anybody whose name it is so that nobody's embarrassed. Listen to this. There was one lady, let's call her Hannah. She had no money. She had very little clothes for her kids. And that month she couldn't even pay her rent. And she came to Mecha Shlomo. She got a number, let's say 43. And she comes onto the street and they told her, show us what number you have. They said 43, you take the box. She comes home, she opens up the box. She can't believe it. Beautiful clothes for her children. And as she's going through the clothes, she thought it was a box only for kids' clothes. There was a dress there. It was very pretty. And she put it over herself to see if it would fit her. And it was a perfect size. And that night, that night, she had to go to a Sheva Brachot. And she wasn't going to go because she didn't have a nice dress. Now she puts on the dress and it fits her perfect. She was so happy. Now she had food for the kids, now clothes for the kids, and she had a beautiful dress to go to the Sheva Brochot. Listen to this, you won't believe it. As she's walking out of the house, all of a sudden she feels like a pinch, like a pin. As if that, you know, the one who gave over the dress left a pin in there or a needle or something. And she takes a look and she sees it is a pin but the pin is connected to an envelope. When she put on the dress, the envelope was inside, on, not on the outside, so she, she didn't see it in the beginning. She takes out the pin, she takes out the envelope, and she reads this letter, you could cry. And the letter says like this, if you are wearing this dress, then you probably need the money that I put in this envelope. Use it well and just enjoy it. In there was $950, the exact amount of money she needed for that month's rent. 
That's a Lev Tov. If I saw that woman in the five towns, I don't know who she is, I would stand up for her. If I was sitting, I would stand up. And if I was standing, I would sit down so I could stand up for her. That lady wouldn't, will never know who got the, that envelope. All she knows is that she put in a dress together with the children's clothes so the mother of that child or those children would be able to have a beautiful dress and she would have money because if she's getting money, if she's getting clothes from Mincha Shlomo, obviously she needs the money. That's what Leif Tov is all about. I want to tell you something else so amazing. You know, in Pirkei Avot, there are six chapters. The sixth one is the longest one. And Rab Aaron Kotler in Mishnas Rab Aaron writes these things. And he says, in the last Pedek, chapter six, and in the Mishnah, it tells us that Mishnah five, Mishnah hey, that there are 48 ways to get and conquer Torah. Why 48? So he says, because the days of Sefirah, when we are counting from Pesach until Shavuot are 49, every day you're supposed to learn one new one, 48, and then on the 49th day, that's a day of Kedushah, right before Yontif, you try to learn all of them together. So when you get home or tomorrow, take a look at Perik Vov Mishnehei, and see the 48 ways how you're supposed to get Torah, how you could conquer Torah for yourself. Every day, take one and study it, think about it, discuss it with someone, your spouse, your child, your friend. Every day, do one. And then, right before Shavuot, on the 49th day, you do all of them. And then we come to Shavuot. So listen to what Rabbi Aaron Cutler says. A genius remark and it teaches us something so important. He says, you know what the 10th one is? The 10th one, how to get Torah, is dibuk chaverim. Dibuk chaverim means be close to your friends. And he asks a question. You know, we all know, that during the days of Sefira, Rabbi Akiva lost 24,000 Talmudim, 24,000 Students died. Why did they die only now this time during Sefira? Imagine if they would have died before Rosh Hashanah. Every rabbi would be able to get up here and say, oh my goodness, we got to be so careful before Rosh Hashanah. These students didn't give COVID one to the other. They didn't give honor to the other. Let's do tshuva before Rosh Hashanah. Fine. But why did they die during Sefira? During Pesach and Shavuot, before Kabbalah ta Torah, listen to what Rabbi Aaron says. He says there's a great lesson here. Because these are the days that we talk about giving over Torah to the next generation. That's what Shavuos is all about. From Pesach, we said it's like Cholamoyed. We're preparing ourselves every day higher and higher and higher, like the Bnei Yisachcha says. That's why we make Shekhi Yonim at the end. That's what Rabbi Aaron says. Every day we study one Midah, how to get better. But you know why they died during this time? Because if you do not have honor for your friend, including your children and your students, then you are not the one who's going to pass Torah to the next generation. These 24,000, they were going to be teachers. But if they didn't give kavod, they didn't give honor one to the other, they died right before Kabbalah ta Torah because they can't give over the Torah. A father or a mother or a Rebbe or a Mora or a principal who doesn't love the student or the child and doesn't treat them with respect, they will never be successful in transferring Torah. You've got to love that child no matter what. You have to respect that child. And then, when you love them and you have the dibuk chaverim and you give the covet one to the other, oh, then you could be a teacher. Then you could be the one that gives over the Torah. But they did not, unfortunately. Those 24,000 Talmudim, they did not give covet one to the other. And so therefore, they could not give over the Torah. And that's why they died before Shavuot. So let me show you what it means when you love a student. 
You know that today, there's a very great organization. It's called Torah Masora. Torah Masora is an organization for all the teachers in the yeshivas and Beis Yaakovs and the day schools across America. And all the principals come once a year. They have a very big convention. And all these rabbis and teachers, they all come. It's just an incredible thing. So one year, there was a principal who spoke. And he told this story. Listen to this story. How touching this story is. This man was a principal in a school in Lakewood, Avram Mandelbaum. And Bli Ayanara in Lakewood, there are so many children in the schools. Two weeks ago, before Pesach, I spoke for a program called Avoy Subarim. Avoy Subarim means fathers who come to learn with their kids. They had it in 50 different shuls throughout the winter. And right before Pesach, they all got together. The children, there was no room to have the parents. You know how many, they had only kids from 5th to 8th grade. You know how many kids there were at that? I couldn't believe it. From 5th to 8th grade, there were 1,800 kids. Believe I in Allah. 5th to 8th grade, 1,800 boys. Now, in this school that this story happened, he was the principal of only the 3rd and 4th grade, and there were a couple hundred kids in those grades. He got 10 3rd grades and 10 4th grades. So he told everybody this story. That any time a kid is sent out of school, out of the class, and he comes to the principal's office, so he's got to give him Mossad. He's got to tell him, you know, what he did wrong. And he speaks to him, but every time he sends the kid back to class, he says, don't forget Avi, or don't forget Shlomo, whichever the kid's name is, I love you. And then he sends him back to class. Every time, no matter what the kid did, he gives him Mossad, he tells him how he has to improve, and he says, don't forget, Shimon, I love you. And he sends him to class. He told us that one day this kid comes in and this kid was always in the office, one of these troublemakers. And he tells him whatever he tells him and he sends him to class. Ten minutes later, Rabbi Mandelbaum had to leave the office and he sees the kid is standing outside the office. He says, Shimon, I thought I told you ten minutes ago to go back to your class. Listen what the kid said. He said, Rebbe, you forgot to tell me you love me. <laughs> you could cry from that. That's why he didn't go back. Who knows if that's why he got into trouble in the first place. So he should be able to hear from the principal that he loves him. Maybe he never heard it from his father and his mother. They're too busy doing a hundred other things and they forgot to tell the kid how much they love them. Tonight, before your kids go to sleep, each one of them kiss them. And tell them you love them. And if you're sitting right next to them right now, you can do it also. Right. I saw her. But that's the point. You have to tell the kids you love them. And if they feel that you really love them, then you're going to be able to transfer Torah over to them. Now listen to this also a beautiful story. There was a rabbi, Rabbi Lazer Geltzel, who was a great principal. His father, Allah Shalom, was the principal of Or Yisrael many, many years ago here in Forest Hills. So this Lazer Geltzel had a yeshiva in Brooklyn. And one day he decided he's going to take the children in the school. He's going to take them to Israel. And they're going to visit many, many great rabbis. And they'll all get brachot and get good wishes for Hatzlacha from the great rabbis in Israel. While he was on the bus, they passed a cemetery. And Rabbi Geltzeler knew that there was a great tzaddik that was buried in that cemetery. So he said to the boys, look, I know we came to see the live rabbis, but it's a very big schut if you pray by the grave of a tzaddik that passed away. And especially if you say some words of Divrei Torah that he said, that's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to ask the bus driver to stop the bus. We'll all get off, we'll pray. And we'll say Divrei Torah. I'll tell you some Torah that that rabbi said. And it'll be a schut for the neshama of all of us. Every single kid got off the bus except one. All the kids are off the bus. And they're waiting for Rabbi Geltzel to get off the bus. But he sees this kid in the first seat. He's not getting off. He said to him, little boy, you don't want to go pray by the tzaddik? So the little boy says, Rebbe, I'm a Kohen. And I can't go into the cemetery. 
Rabbi Gelzala had forgot that this kid is a Kohen. And now this kid felt so bad because 35 boys were going in and he was left alone. Now listen to the genius of this Rebbe. Imagine what would we do if we were Rabbi Gelzala. Listen to what he said to this kid. He said, my child, today we're all going in there and you're remaining outside. But when Mashiach comes and the base of Migdash is here, you're the Kohen, you're going to go inside and we're going to be outside. And the kid felt like a million bucks. He felt so special. Here he felt like the outcast. He's the Kohen, he can't go in and pray. No, the Rebbe made him feel so special because when the Beis Amidash comes, he's going to go in and do the Avodah. That's a Rebbe who loves his child. Only a Rebbe who loves his child could even think of something like that. Most of us, who knows what we would have said to the kid. But the point is, that's what love is all about. And that's what Rabbi Aaron Cutler writes, that when you give over with love, then you could give over Torah. But if it's not with love and they didn't have kavod one to the other, then unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Now, I want to ask you a question. You know, this always puzzled me. Now, a person should never, ever use the expression, this Gemara bothers me, or this Pasuk, bo no Gemara should bother you. You could say, I don't understand it. It's puzzling, it's confounding. But chas v'shalom, never to use that expression that this Gemara bothers me. Or no Gemara should bother you. This Gemara that I'm about to tell you always puzzled me. And I wondered why, what is the pshat, what is the meaning? Listen to this. We know the Gemara tells us in Yevomus, Samach Bey, Zamet Bey, 62b. The Gemara tells us that Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 Talmidim and they died. They died. Why? Because they didn't give covered. They didn't give honor one to the other. So I ask you, is that a reason to die? And that's what puzzled me. Nobody killed anybody. Nobody drove on Shabbat. Nobody ate Yom Kippur. Why should they die? It's got to be probably another, another, you know, punishment. Why did they have to die? And one time I saw something that the Maral says. And I want to read it to you because it's something that we should remember. The Maral was one of the greatest commentaries, a genius who had such original thought. And of course, he was the Rov in the Shul in Prague. And he writes like this. When you give covet and honor to your friend, that's what the essence of life is. When you give honor to somebody, you give them life. If you take away honor, you're taking away life. Imagine you walked in here tonight and not one person said good evening to you. Everybody ignored you. Nobody said anything to you. You would feel, what am I doing here? What am I living for? Nobody cares about me? Nobody said hello to me? Nobody? When you validate somebody, you give them life. You tell somebody they have a nice dress, they have a nice tie, a nice shirt. You make them feel special. You tell this little boy, I love your tzitzis. Right? Now he feels good, right? Tomorrow he's going to remember that the rabbi said he's got this, he's wearing his tzitzis and he's out so late at night to listen to Torah. Hashem shall bless you. Amen. Say amen. He's going to feel special because somebody validated him, made him feel special. And that's why they died. Because when you give kavod, you give life. When you take away kavod, you take away life. And if that's the case, I want to ask you to imagine something for a moment. Imagine this for a moment. Imagine you are Rabbi Akiva. And you are the rabbi and the teacher of 24,000 students that died. And they died within a period of 33 days. So you know how many died every day? I did the math. 727 died every day. Imagine, they called the rabbi, Rabbi, you gotta go to a funeral in Tveria. That young man who was so bright, he just died. Please give a hesped, give a eulogy. And then when he finishes in Tveria, they say, Rabbi, you gotta go to Tzfas. That young guy who just got married. 
He was such a bright guy. Yo, Yeshiva, he died. Please come and give a hesped. And he finishes in Tzfas and he finishes in Tveria. And they say, Rebbe, you got to come to Yushalayim. That guy who knew Shas by heart, he had a photographic memory. You loved him, he just died. Please give a hesped. And Rabbi Kiva's going crazy. He's running from Ashdod to Ashkelon to Haifa to Tzfas to Tveria. Every plate, there's no end. If you were Rabbi Akiva, what would you say? Okay, Hashem, I get it. I'm not the one to teach Torah. You don't like my Torah? I'm out of here. I'll go find another job. I'll do something else. But I'm not going to teach Torah. Obviously, you don't like my Torah. All my students died. What did Rabbi Akiva do? That's not what he did. You know what he did? The Medrash and also the Gemara tells us. He took a group of students and he said, Rabbi we made a mistake. We didn't teach them properly. We only taught them Torah. We didn't teach them to be nice to each other. We got to start all over again. And some say he took five students. Others say he took seven. And then, you know what the Gemara says? The Medrash, Umolu kol Eretz Yisrael Torah. He built a whole Eretz Yisrael filled with Torah. You know what that shows me? A Jew never gives up. Rabbi Akiva didn't give up. He lost 700 Talmidim a day. And most of us would say, okay, I'm out of here. I made a mistake, I'm out of here. No, no, no. It's true, you made a mistake, but you start over. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because the last three years we've gone through difficult times. COVID, Maron, the tragedy, Surfside, Ukraine, so many terrible things, so much anti-Semitism. So many terror attacks in Israel. A person can say, I'm out of here. God, I'm out of here. No, no, no. A Jew never gives up. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your marriage. And most important, don't give up on yourself. A Jew never gives up. Hang in there. That's what Chazak is all about. That's what Torah Anytime is all about. That's what all these great organizations that the Meirovs are putting together. We stick together. We're there for each other in the difficult times. Because that's what we learned from the days of Tzafira. We go higher and higher and higher. And we do it together. And we do it together. And then we're going to reach what Shavuot is all about. So I just want to tell you one more thing. And then we'll end with a beautiful poem. You know, one of the first people who passed away during COVID was the Novominska Rebbe, Rabbi Yaakov Perlau. He was the head of the Agudas Yisrael organization, a great, great Talmud Chacham, a very powerful, eloquent speaker, both in Yiddish and in English. And he was a leader. Many, many, many people looked up to him. And recently an article was written about him in Mishpacha magazine. I just want to give them credit because they told a story over there that I think that we could all gain from. When he was a young man, he learned in the yeshiva of Chaim Berlin. The Rosh Yeshiva at the time was Rabbi Yitzchak Kutner, a brilliant, brilliant Tamid Chacham. There was a boy who came to Chaim Berlin from Canada and Rabbi Hutner tried to work with him and gave him chizuk. And one day the uncle of this boy from Canada came into the office of Rabbi Hutner, and he gave him an envelope. There was obviously money in the envelope. Rav Hutner opened it up, and he was shocked, because it was a tremendous amount of money, much more than he imagined that an uncle would give. Obviously, the uncle was giving it in gratitude, because his nephew had come from Canada, and Rabbi Hutner had taken an interest in him. And Rav Hutner opened up the envelope, and he said, like, what's haste? Like, what are you doing? Why are you giving so much? And the man said something in Yiddish. Now, I know that most of you don't understand Yiddish, but of course, Torah anytime goes all over the world, and many people do understand it. And Yiddish was my mother tongue. That's how I grew up, and I love the language. So I just want to say it in Yiddish, but of course, I'm going to translate. And the rich man said to Rabbi Hutner, Was haste? What do you mean? A Yid darf sich iber strengen. A Jew has to exert himself. A Jew has to do more than the average person. A Yid, a Jew, Darvzach, has to, Ibish, that means go beyond the call of duty. 
And that's what the Avoida, that's what all of us have to be like between Pesach and Shavuos. We got to do more than we've been doing till now. We have to be a Lev Toiv more than we were before. We have to love our children and our students and our families more than we ever did before to be able to give over the Torah. And like Rabbi Akiva, we have to believe in ourselves. Never give up on yourself. Never give up on your family. And never give up on Klal Yisrael. So I just want to end with this beautiful poem. This is a poem that is written in the Syrian Sidurim. And sometimes they read it at a brist, Milah. But I first saw it in my synagogue. Not, I'm not the rabbi there, but where I prayed... I don't know where the rabbi got it from, but he put it in a plaque and it was right where the chazan would pray. And it says like this. Ben Adam, man, lomo tidag al hadamim. Why are you worried so much about your money? Velo tidag al hayamim. But you're not worried about your days. So here's the poem. Ben Adam, lomo tidag al hadamim. Velo tidag al hayamim. Now, then it says like this. Ki hadamim, Enam ozrim. Your money at the end is not going to help you. Vahayomim enam chuzrim. Your days, they're not coming back. You know, yesterday is not coming back, ever. You know, your money, if you lose it, you could get back some money, but it's not going to help you in the long run. It's the days, by making every day count, that's what the Imre Yemes said about his father, the Sfas Yemes. He lived only 56 years, but he had arichas yomim. And that's what we want. We want to make every day count. Redoif, the poem ends. Achar ha-Torah v'ha-mitzvot. Run after Torah and mitzvot. Asher heim lo'ad kayamim. They exist forever. Let us hope on this holy night of Sefirat Omer, the days of Cholomoyed between Pesach and Shavuot, let us take these lessons seriously. And then at the end, by Shavuot, we'll all be able to say Shechayano, who knows if we learn all the lessons, maybe indeed Mashiach will come and we'll be able to say it in Yushalayim Kodesh. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening and have a good evening. Okay.